Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are at the tail end of our lecture series for fall. Um, thank you for joining us for the celebration last week, if you were able to. We have four lectures left. Um, this fall, we're celebrating 40 years of the lecture series. So we have invited um, our award-winning faculty and programs um, to come and speak with you. And it's been a really nice, interesting variety of presentations. Uh, what we have remaining um, next week, we have a preview of the 2024 presidential election. The week after that, we'll have performances by our award-winning forensics team, and then we wrap it up with the U.S. Supreme Court. So some interesting things to wrap up with. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started for today. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Ed Education at UW-Whitewater, and we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. So thank you for having us, and, and we're um, glad to be a partner with you all. Um, today's presenter is Brian Shannon. He's a lecturer of communication at UW-Whitewater. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Communication and Master of Science in Mass Communication, also from UW-Whitewater. He teaches courses in media production, history, film, and media effects. In, a t in addition to teaching, Brian coaches the university's award-winning competitive speaking team. Please welcome Brian Shannon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, along with on the forensics thing, uh, I am the director of that group of students that will be performing in a couple of weeks. There is nothing involving dead bodies with forensics. Uh, it is competitive public speaking. Um, and I also realize that most of you are probably like, I can't imagine even giving up and giving one speech, let alone competitively, but I get to work with an awesome group of students uh, each and every day uh, in regards to that outside of my normal teaching responsibilities as well. So uh, as Carrie said, my name is Brian Shannon. Um, I earned my undergraduate degree and master's degree from UW-Whitewater uh, in looking at mass communication. Uh, I grew up in an era that was very interesting in the world of communication. I basically kind of was one of those children that grew up as social media developed as a thing that people all of a sudden were like, oh, we need to pay attention to it. Uh, when I was an undergrad student um, early in my career, uh, there was a internet phenomenon known as Coney 2012. It was a video that was posted on YouTube. It was about 23 minutes in length and then was just wide open for people to distribute and send to whoever. And so within about the period of, I want to say about 24 to 36 hours, this video went absolutely gangbusters. It got a few million views within that 24-hour period. And so young Brian was like, why? What, what led to this thing that caught so much steam about this man from halfway around the world that generally, you know, most people wouldn't pay attention to unless somebody posted a 23-minute video that went absolutely gangbusters online. And so that kind of really cemented, hey, my interest is in understanding how do we make people care about something that maybe we wouldn't normally care about. And so when I got into grad school and started to be able to take time to really dive into this, I got into the concept of agenda setting theory. And so that's what we're going to take a look at today, because I think it's the best way to describe how does things in society make us all of a sudden be like, oh, that is something that is important. That is something that I want to understand or that I'll bring up over the next cup of coffee or something like that. And the roots of it go back to about 1939 when this gentleman, Bernard Cohen, said this. The media may not be successful much of the time in telling people what to think, but it is stunningly successful in telling its readers what to think about. So in other words, not so much saying this is, we should think ice cream is good or bad. We should just think about ice cream instead. Now, there's other theorists that'll point to that other half, but we're focused on the, hey, let's talk about some ice cream. So media history is about more voices. When I teach media history to many of my students, I, I early on introduce the idea, and then I come back to it time and time again, that every time there's a new innovation, there is going to be more ideas in circulation. 
more ideas for people to agree or disagree with. So when the printing press was first invented by Johannes Gutenberg, people said, oh, this is, the church said, oh, this is great. We can replicate Bibles faster and they can be more universal. Because originally to create a new copy of a Bible, the monks would have to hang out and write line for line every single line of the Bible. And that would be one copy. And so I tell my group of Gen Zers who were, you know, have grown up on, on text messages and stuff, imagine having to write an entire Bible day after day after day, and they look at me like, why would I ever try to do that? And I say, well, that's actually what they did. That's how they replicated it. But as a result of it, no, one bi no two Bibles were the same. They would use shorthand to make it a little bit easier. One person might write with font this big. Another person might write with font this big. And so, you know, imagine a book club around the Bible. Yeah, on page five. On somebody else, that was page 25 because their monk wrote a little bit bigger. And so the church was like, great, we can make this mass replication a lot quicker and a lot easier. The exact opposite happened. People realized, hey, I, I don't agree with what this group of people is preaching. But I can make up some alternative thought, 95 theses from Martin Luther, for example, and I can make many copies of it and put this alternative idea into circulation to a mass audience. So all of a sudden, the church now thought, hey, this printing press was going to revolutionize the way that we were able to get our word out to more people. The exact opposite kind of happened. The printing press would eventually, I would argue, lead to the, US, the United States Revolutionary War because many of the pamphlets that were arguing, hey, we need to break from Great Britain, were produced on underground printing presses that they were able to then distribute to mass amounts of people on street corners saying, hey, we, should, we have this alternative vision of what society could look like, and we're going to put it out there, and we're going to put it out in mass circulation. And we can trace that through to TV and social media that new technology comes around and people are like, this is going to lead to world peace. But instead, we've just gotten more arguing and more debate. And so what, what, what can we kind of base some of this idea off of where people are like, nope, this is important and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there. And so these two gentlemen here are McCombs and Shaw. And I, they are probably some of the most prolific authors of mass media research. They have their names on a lot, of, a lot of different papers. They were doing a study at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And when we look sometimes at academic research, it becomes a thing that you read it and you're like, well, why didn't I think of that? That seems so straightforward. Why didn't I think of that idea? And so what they did in 1972 is they went around the campus and, and the, the greater community that UNC um, Chapel Hill is located, and they interviewed people. And they simply asked, what, what things happening in society are important to you? Just that question. And they started a massive running list of all of the things that people were saying, whatever it was that was very important at this point in time in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in 1972. And then they went to the local papers and they took a look at all of the headlines and started a second list. What things were being talked about in these headlines in the local papers? And what do you know? The lists were nearly identical. That was the start of agenda setting theory. Now, they didn't know which was leading to which, right? They were at the chicken and the egg stage at this point. But they knew they had two matching lists, that the newspaper matched what the people they ask around Chapel Hill said were important work. And so they stumbled upon the mass media theory that essentially has the most research on it. They've had hundreds, if not thousands, at this point of articles about it. They do reviews every decade or two about how many articles there are, and at this point, I think they've, they've ultimately lost count. So if I were to go around, and I do this with my students in class when I teach this theory to a classroom of about 120 students in, in each fall semester, 
And I tell, ask them, unprompted, what are important things to you? Get this list, bring it up on the, the projector. I then go to the New York Times website. Every semester, I can pull things over from whatever list that they produced to now. So if I went a couple of weeks now, I'm gonna be doing that activity with my students. If I did it today, I would expect somebody would mention something probably about football. Somebody would probably mention about something to do with Israel and, and all of the things that are going on over there. Or I'd get a couple of students. And so I can point to that and say, yep, that is what is you know, being covered in, in the media environment, that there is that, that connection. So research went on and continued to do its iterative process as research does. And then about 1984, a researcher finally put a diagram to it. And this is the diagram, this is probably my favorite academic diagram. Yes, I have favorite academic diagrams. I study media, I'm a little bit of a nerd that way. But it's this triangle here. And so when McCombs and Shaw did their original research, they were very interested in the connection between media and social. Social being what we just talk about within our communities on a day-to-day -day type basis. And what they've found over time is that it's not just, hey, because it's in the newspaper, it matters to society. Or that just because society's talking about it, the newspaper talks about it. They talk to each other. There's, there's a crossover. If society's talking about something, there's a good chance that the local paper might pick it up. Or if the local paper picks it up, the society will talk about it. But then they'll add in, they add in a third element, political. Whatever our leaders in Washington or Madison or City Hall are talking about, society might talk about it. Or vice versa, society's talking about it, so City Hall talks about it. So, for example, maybe in Whitewater, we've got a lake with a number of reeds around the border, and I know there's a lot of different feelings about that. But because the community talks about it, our leaders in City Hall should hopefully talk about it. And then as a result, Whitewater Banner, Whitewater Register, what have you, will cover that fact that that thing was talked about in City Hall during a public meeting. And so those conversations... It doesn't matter. They can go any, any which way. They can be introduced into the conversation any number of different ways, which is why I love that diagram, because it sums up what all those relationships are so concisely and takes a lot of research for me and boils it down into a little diagram. It comes down to issue salience is then what puts it to say, hey, this is something that is important. How relevant is this topic to me in particular is to say, yes, I'm going to go and talk about it. So there was research, as there always tends to be sometimes, somebody has a question then of, well, what makes an issue salient? What could lead someone to say, yes, this is something that is important or something that somebody could pick up for them. The first thing is that there needs to be a quote-unquote conflict. Now, this conflict doesn't need to be something that is no holds barred, two sides entrenched, just that there is my conflict communication scholars coming out here and saying that there needs to be a breakdown in communication that something isn't being communicated effectively. Something is just leading to odds. Someone says one thing, another person says another. But specifically that that conflict, A, has to be substantive. So there has to be some sort of substance to it. There has to be some sort of major meaning to it. So, one of the examples I love to use in my classes, because I know there's strong opinions, but I'm not gonna get raked over the coals for it. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Because I know that there will be students that'll be like, I'm ready to debate this, but I know that at the end of the semester, they're not gonna be like, the instructor talked about whether pineapple belongs on pizza, and I have an issue with that. 
right? We, we, we think that's funny, but it would probably fail. Like, but there's a reason that we don't wake up in the morning taking a very strong stance on that. It doesn't really necessarily first fit in that idea of substantive. It's not going to have a major impact on our lives. If we want pineapple on our pizza, we'll order pineapple on our pizza. If we don't, we don't, and we go on with our life. Second, there needs to be some sort of element of position or resources that these conflicting parties are discussing. That there is an opportunity to advance, to have an, a, a larger say, to have more of some sort of resource or less of some sort of a problem. So, you know, the resources, for example, might be more money for a freeway, which would be the resource, but also position, you know, hey, I now have a shorter commute, for example, or something like that. And then final, finally, especially in the media part, there needs to be definable parties. So in other words, it's clearly this team, this team, we'll call it, and this team. It makes it easy to set up a narrative. There is one side and another, and there is a clear line in the sand between what those two parties are. And that also, but that one for the pineapple on pizza works great. There is pineapple or there, there is not. But we have that very clear then definitive line. But it's created one of four ways. The first is that it's created by one of the parties. So in other words, somebody says, hey, this is an issue. We need to talk about this. Because it is an issue, we think it's important. Let's talk about it. And the other side says, you know, we have a different perspective on it. The second one takes that a little bit of a step farther and specifically says they establish that issue for their own gain, for their own goals. So one of the things that political communication scholars will talk about is that different political groups have different strengths and weaknesses. You bring up one thing, they talk really well on it, they have a really good way of talking about it, but you bring up something else and that's just a losing issue for them. It just doesn't work out. So sometimes parties will bring up an issue because, hey, they realize this is one of our strengths, so this is, this is our game plan. This is how we're going to go about it. We're going to raise this issue to be important because we know we can benefit from having that. The third one is a current event, something completely outside of the party's controls. Something happens, and suddenly now they need to take action on it. Right? All of a sudden, there is a hurricane, and we now need to deal with that. Right, These parties aren't creating hurricanes in the Gulf. That is a natural phenomenon that happens. They have to now deal with it. It is a current issue. And then the fourth one is there is a whistleblower. I think this is a little bit more of an extreme word, but this is what the researchers used, that somebody else outside of the traditional structure says, hey, this is something that we need to take up and we need to discuss. A citizen says, hey, here's this problem. You have to deal with it. We've got plenty of examples uh, through history of somebody coming up and saying, hey, we found some sort of violation, something that is questionable. We need to deal with it. That would be the whistleblower. All of a sudden now, hey, this is an issue of salience. Edward Snowden says the government has a bunch of phone logs. The whistleblower suddenly now all of a sudden society is talking a lot about the fact that the government has phone records on citizens. The whistleblower brought that to be important. But then how does that translate down to us? We have these parties, creates this issue, but then how does that come down to us saying, hey, we need to somehow deal with this situation? And so this need for orientation model is probably my second favorite diagram. The first question people will ask themselves when they encounter a new piece of information is, does it matter to me or not? Now, I could say this is a sliding continuum, but for today we'll just make it, it's either important to me or it's not. So, something happens in our local community, 
with our local government, we might care about it because it's relevant to us because we live in Whitewater. That same thing happens in, I'm gonna pull a random city out of a hat, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We may never hear about it. Or if we do, we're like, meh, go about my day because it's not relevant to us. We don't live in Eau Claire and so whatever the thing was, not gonna affect me, it's not gonna be on our agenda. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, what are important things? You're not gonna put that thing on your list because it's not important to you with where you live. So high versus low relevancy. Is it relevant to you? Then the next spot, come, so then if it's low, low relevant, see, we just have low need for orientation. It's not important to us, we're not gonna look for more, we're probably not gonna look for more information, we're just gonna move on with our life. High relevancy though, we're now gonna ask ourselves, how much do we know about this topic? So now it's getting to the point of what do I and what don't I know? And if I say, hey, I don't know a lot about this issue. I'm not informed about this issue. Maybe it's the first time I've heard it or it's a topic that I just haven't read a lot about or spent a lot of time studying, but now this thing, hey, this is super important to me. That's gonna lead to a high need for orientation. That's gonna lead to what they would call high salience. It's gonna be more likely that if I was, if McCombs and Shaw poofed out of nowhere and said, hey, what's an important issue? That you might say, this is an important issue for me because it's important to me, but I don't know a lot about it. Then kind of the middle ground is maybe you've, you've done a fair bit of research on it. You maybe have a good feeling for where the thing is going. You, you know what's happening you'll have a moderate need for orientation. So you're, you, you land in the middle. You're, you're, you're neither here nor there. You haven't completely written it off, but also you're probably definitely not losing sleep about it at night. It's probably not gonna be very high on your list if McCombs and Shaw popped out of thin air somewhere and asked you what was important in your life. So making sure, so the first thing is seeing, hey, is this something that is relevant to us, then the next thing is, what is our uncertainty? And so if we return back to the example from the beginning when I was talking about the Coney movement back in 2012 with uh, essentially a warlord that was kidnapping children in Africa. The video, to its credit, did something here with the high versus low relevancy. They found a way to make it relevant to the users. One thing about Gen Z is that they tend to have a very caring personality. They care about the betterment of other people. And so all of a sudden, children are being abused, kidnapped, etc. That goes against you and what they know. Oh, now this is all of a sudden something relevant to me. There's gonna be a high uncertainty immediately with that because it's not something that gets talked about a whole lot in social studies classrooms, that there is this warlord, there's this war going on in Central Africa and everything that's happening with it. There is just, a, there is a deficit knowledge there. So they manage to say, hey, it's relevant to you. I would argue that high uncertainty was a very easy ingredient for them to hit high need for orientation, suddenly, let's share this, let's try to do something with this. Now, over the coming weeks after that video initially went out, there was a number of reports that the organization that was behind it was, we'll say that there was questions that, that were raised about it, and so, you know, it, it sowed enough doubt then where, okay, now that they have less uncertainty, maybe it's not as relevant now, then it falls off the agenda, it, it moves on, and it, they, they don't care about it as much, and it kind of fades to the annals of history until I have a mass comm lecture and I bring it back up as being, you know, the genesis of one of my interests in, in social media. And so, 
agenda setting theory got its roots when the media landscape was lot, a lot less complex. It was newspapers, it was magazines, it was radio, it was TV channels. So pretty easily definable who produces the message, who takes in the message. The, the station, the newspaper, etc., writes the story, we consume it. The internet has changed that dynamic. Now all of a sudden, People can talk really easy and really fast, interject themselves into the stories. Um, one of the favorite pictures I show in one of my classes is a picture of an ad for um, a certain airline promoting it being like, hey, here's some great fares. And then there's a comment immediately underneath it that says, service was horrible, I hate this airline. And that now in advertising, all of a sudden your message can be interrupted by an unhappy customer and that that is a completely different game changer. So with the internet, we now have more voices, meaning more challenges. During the Boston Marathon in 2013, when there was the bombing incident, that night, people, internet sleuths, were on Twitter saying, we think we found who it is that perpetrated these attacks. Hooray for the internet. We found who, who did this. The name was shared widely on social media. They didn't have the right guy. All of a sudden, somebody who was completely unrelated to the situation, life turned upside down overnight. Internet rumor, run amok. And so that is just a prime definition of how all of a sudden the internet and social media can greatly change what we consider is important in how we are viewing a specific issue. And so one of the terms that I teach my students early on is the concept of a gatekeeper. And the simple way that I define it is it's anyone who controls access to information and people. And it's not neither good nor bad. You need to go to the doctor's office and you check in with the registration person. And the person's like, yep, 15 minutes, they'll see you cool, you go sit down, or they say, hey, I had you down for actually next week. That was me a couple, a year or two ago. Um, okay, schedule an appointment for a different time because next week does not work for me. Turn around, leave, right? That's a gatekeeper, right? Not good nor bad. They just control the access to that information. People who you know are picking what stories are going in the newspaper, same thing, they hold a gatekeeping function, they have a certain amount of physical paper space that they can fit news stories in, so some days some stories make it in, some days don't. There's a joke about, hey, that was a slow news day, right? The, the, the gatekeepers had to find something to fill, fill the broadcast. So when we've moved to online, and for example, the Boston Marathon story, we suddenly now have what we could call either a diminished or an increased gatekeeping ability. Because now anybody can put any information out there, so there's a lot less gatekeeping because you can just put the information out there. You don't have to hope that a newspaper has the physical page space to put up a story. So it limit, So there's, there's less gatekeeping. But there's also more gatekeeping ability. We can choose what we want to find when we look online. We can, we can be more selective in what we choose. And so all of a sudden now the information that we're having and how we're shaping our own agendas changes. How we shape what we view as important is going to be vastly different. There's going to be far more and far wider lists than what McCombs and Shaw had in 1972. I would be very curious and maybe Someday when I have the time, I will need to run a replica of that study in the Whitewater area to see if that, how well those lists would line up just off of, of, of wide guess because we now have so many different areas and avenues for us to pick up information. 
So with things like the Boston Marathon bombing, one of the questions scholars did ask is, when a crisis happens, what is social media's role? We saw that with the Boston Marathon bombing, they decided to try to go on a manhunt, and they got the wrong guy. And also, right around that time with the Boston Marathon, too, there was a lot of rumors about, hey, there's another bomb located in another place. There was a lot of social media rumors about what, what was exactly happening in that time. And so what they started to do was they started to trace when crises happen, where are people going and looking for information? And so reading the article at least gave me a little bit more faith in especially our younger people when they're looking for information, that initially, in, in the midst of the moment, when the crisis is really happening, people are going to social media sites to find information because that is the quickest place to get the information. Because hopefully um, different entities that are close to the situation are putting out information being like, hey, avoid this area because something is happening. Um, saying, hey, you know, we're going to have a press conference. There's people on the ground that are not trained in journalism but might be saying, hey, this thing happened. Uh, Arab Spring in 2010, when a number of uprisings happened in Middle Eastern countries, the messages about that were spread to countries like the United States through social media channels, utilizing those channels as a way of, hey, let's get this message out there to a much larger group of people. So initially, social media is kind of telling the narrative. But once the trained journalists and the more traditional channels get their boots on the ground and start asking people questions, going to resources that they have, the audience starts to switch along with them. And they start to move away from the social media channels and start to look to more traditional outlets for their information because now they're the ones that have been able to do the extensive research, put the pieces together, draw in the connections now that we've had some time to digest what was happening. So they don't just go to social media and stay there. Instead, they use it at first, and then they transition. And so traditional media has continued to hold its place in kind of the more medium to long-term storytelling abilities that it has. And social media has found its place in the quick, fast realm. The printing press meant that it was going to take a while for something to come out because it, they had to get the information and then put it down on, on paper. And in some of the days as papers got going, there was newspapers that would pay people to go hang out on an island off the shore of New York to try and intercept ships as they came in from Great Britain so that they would be the first ones to be able to publish something in the paper to make things faster. Or if you needed to pass the news along, it was a couple day process to do that. TV and radio made that even faster. One of the things I tell my students is that, uh, it's kind of morbid, but JFK has a unique trait about his assassination. He's the only president to ever die in office in the era of TV. The fast, newsing move, fast moving news, Walter Cronkite said, don't write me a script, just get me the air. He had that fateful announcement that JFK had died in the hospital. That was, and as he said that, you could tell he was struggling with it because he was the, one of the, if not the first journalist to have to physically, visibly deliver that type of news to a nation. And so that made it even faster, but now social media has kind of become the even faster route for information. So once something has suddenly become put on somebody's agenda, Coney has been put on what I would call just a bunch of millennials agendas of saying, hey, this is a thing that, that is going on, that yes, they had all of this coverage and that, that could be great, but what's the long-term ramification of it? There's still a lot of questions around this area. This is the area that when I was writing my master's thesis and looking at this stuff where I got frustrated because that's where the research started to stop. But that also means that, that that's where I have questions to do further research. That once something has been put on a public's agenda, 
it will forever hold a slightly higher status than before that event happened. That once the thing has reached the point of, hey, this is something that is important, yes, it will diminish over time, but it won't completely go away. A number of years ago, there was the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, where people basically doused themselves in five-gallon buckets of ice water and donated to ALS Foundation. And people said, I mean, that's cool that a bunch of young people are dumping themselves full of ice to talk about ALS, but is it really doing anything? ALS, the, the organization said, absolutely, you know, we are seeing an influx of additional donations that we normally didn't plan for. A couple months later, researchers went back to take a look, examine, do people still talk about it, have fundraising levels return to pre-ice bucket challenge levels or are they still up? They were still up. There was still an increased attention to it. Was it, you know, anywhere close to where it was at its fever pitch? Absolutely not. But was it better than before that thing had ever happened? Before it had ever really been this massive public agenda thing? Absolutely. And so once something reaches that salience level, we all of a sudden now have a sense of this is important, this is something I know more about, and it's hopefully something that I care about, that I find as important, that I add in to my conversations. Um, it's not news related and it's definitely not agenda setting theory related per se, but a number of years ago, my fiance and I were driving to dinner with family. And I don't know what got us exactly on the subject, but we got on the subject of beavers. And I was driving, so I, I had my eyes on the road. But my fiance got on her phone, started looking up facts about beavers. Beavers have an innate built-in function where if they hear running water, they need to put an end to it immediately. And so we get beaver dams. The longest of which is a half mile long in Canada, and it's getting longer. Beavers were never unnecessarily on my agenda, but I now have that random factoid that I now dump on audiences and definitely students, and they take that home and say, I learned something new in class. It may not have been what my topic was about, but I learned something new. You got to hear about it, uh, and, and the students get a good laugh about it. So. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here today, and now I think we've got a couple moments for a couple of questions. I'll call it the Q&A, but if you have other questions for Brian Shannon, you can come up and, and ask him now. But please join me in thanking Brian for